society. So, Kruzat, you can start now. Sure. A very good evening to everyone, our guests and the participants from the leadership cell of St. Stephen's College. Today, we are joined by four most distinguished scholars of modern Indian history who will be addressing the topic decolonization of the British Empire in anticipation to the forthcoming online paper presentation competition, um, which has been jointly organized by the Leadership Cell St. Stephen's in collaboration with the Carvan Initiative. Uh, so without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll be addressing us today. Um, our first speaker for the evening will be Professor Mridula Mukherjee. Um, after graduating from Lady Shriram College, University of Delhi, Professor Mukherjee joined Jawaharlal Nehru University for post-graduation. She then went on to obtain her PhD from JNU as well, working on the thesis for which she joined the Center for Historical Studies at JNU as faculty member, and then went on to become a professor of modern Indian history at JNU. Subsequently, she was appointed at, as chairperson of the Center for Historical Studies. Her areas of specialization include agrarian and peasant history, social history, and the Indian national movement. Ma'am has been a visiting scholar at Duke University and at the Institute of Oriental Culture at University of Tokyo. She has, to her credit, several authoritative works on modern India, including books, edited volumes, and journal articles that most students of this period of history need no introduction for. Ma'am has served as the director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library as well. Thank you for being with us today, ma'am, and we look forward to hearing from you. My pleasure. Our second speaker for today will be Professor Aditya Mukherjee. Professor Mukherjee is an alumnus of St. Stephen's. He then obtained his MA, MPhil, and PhD from the Center of Historical Studies and started teaching contemporary Indian history at GNU in 1976, where he taught for over 40 years. Sir has served as the chairperson of the Center for Historical Studies as well from 2004 to 6. He's been a visiting professor at Duke, a fellow of the Institute of Oriental Culture, a visiting fellow at Lancaster University, and president of the Indian History Congress. He specializes in economic history, particularly business history and the political economy of post-colonial development. His other areas of interest include identity politics, colonialism and nationalism, some of which he'll be exploring in today's talk with us. Uh, welcome, sir, and thank you for joining us today as well. Thank you. Our third speaker for today is Professor Sucheta Mahajan. Professor Mahajan is also a Delhi University alumna and obtained her PhD from GNU. She started her career at Delhi College for Arts and Commerce, where she taught from 1989 to 2005. Since 2005, she has been teaching modern Indian history at GNU. Ma'am has been visiting professor at the College of Wooster in Ohio, a fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, a fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, and a visiting professor at the MSH Paris. Ma'am is a specialist in areas of colonialism, nationalism, and communalism, as well as decolonization in a comparative framework. We look forward to Ma'am's most valuable inputs on our topic today, and we welcome you, Ma'am. Our fourth speaker this evening is Professor Dipesh Chakrabarti. Professor Chakrabarti is an alumnus of Presidency College, University of Calcutta, as well as IIM Calcutta and the Australian National University, from where he obtained his PhD in history. Sir is currently the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor in History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations, and the College at University of Chicago. Some of his field specialties include modern South Asian history and historiography, subaltern indigenous and minority histories, and of course, decolonization. He has visited, um, he has held various visiting fellowship and professorship tenures at the universities of Princeton, Calcutta, Washington, Manchester, among several other very important institutes. Sir is a founding member of the subaltern studies, as well as a founding editor of post-colonial studies, and has many other editorials and publications to his credit. We welcome you, sir. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. This was our esteemed panel for today, and we look forward to a great session ahead. I'll sign off now on behalf of the leadership cell, and I'll invite Ishan from Karma, our moderator for today, to take over. <coughs> for this beautiful introduction, I hope I am audible and visible. You're echoing a bit. <laughs> 
So I'm quite nervous today because I consider all as my inspiration in this subject that I deal with. And I, I, I remember meeting Professor Mridullah Mukherjee in my college when, uh, when, and I asked him, ma'am, can I, can I have a picture with you at the Al Singh College? So good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's panel discussion on a very interesting and fascinating theme that is decolonization of the British Empire. There are debates like, could partition be averted? Or does Britain owe a reparations? Or the debate among historians on historiography of decolonization itself? Or was decolonization only limited to the trans transfer of power in India and other countries? Were, they, were there more aspects to decolonization than the economic aspect? So to dwell more into the topic, we have an esteemed pillar, which was beautifully introduced by Kudrat. The, the British Empire spanned the globe. This lead to the saying that the sun never set on it, since it was always daytime somewhere in the empire at that time. So on Wednesday, on Wednesday Barbados announced it would remove Queen Elizabeth as the, its head of the state and become republic by November of the next year. Between 1947 and 1960, three dozen new states in Asia and Africa achieved autonomy and independence from their colonial heads. Today is also the day when Bahadur Shah Zafar II, the last Mughal emperor, was exiled to Burma. The process of decolonization was not the same everywhere. The consequences were also different. The term decolonization, which is rather a very famous term among scholars, and that has received quite controversy that has you know, garnered quite uh, controversial debates and definitions on the notion of decolonization and its impact. If one say casually, decolonization could be just limited to transfer of power and getting independence, that would be a very small part of it. So when we talk about decolonization, many of us limit ourselves primarily political and economic decolonization, but we miss out on cultural decolonization as well. So I would request our speakers to shed some light on that. And then we'll take our uh, discussion forward, starting with the notion of definition according to our speakers. Maybe, maybe Mridullah ma'am and Adit sir can start the discussion and then we'll uh, go to Professor Sucheta Mahajan and then Professor Deepesh Chakravarti. Which of us should start? Uh, sir, you can start. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, what is your format? Like we make initial opening statements for about five minutes each and then come back for further rounds. Is that how you want to do it? Yes, we can do like that, ma'am. That would be, I think, more clearer to the audience. So that we can start with an opening statement and then uh, you can you know, interject on each other's statements. All right. The first. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be speaking at an event organized by my alma mater. And talking of decolonization, uh, this college, which for a long time got associated with elitism and with uh, you know being very privileged and things like that, but people forget that it has had, in fact, a very close connection with the decolonization that occurred in India particularly with the national movement. I mean, as you're all aware, C.F. Andrews was a professor of philosophy in St. Stephen's. Gandhiji came and stayed in Principal Rudra's house in Kashmiri Gate. Uh, it, is such a, it is said that the non-cooperation uh, resolution was discussed and planned in the halls of uh, St. Stephen's and so on and so forth. I mean, the, there are so many stories about St. Stephen's association with the national movement. For example, the principal one day turning up at the assembly wearing khadi, national, he didn't have to do anything, he just wore khadi to the, to the assembly, things like that. So I'm very glad to be associated with this strand of the college's reputation. The other strand, as I said, has been overcome. There was a period when it was, it was too far linked, just the privileged and the elite. Uh, and, and I'm glad that that link has slowly uh, gone down. Now, talking of decolonization, you're, I think in the introduction, you have said very clearly that and very correctly 
that it is not only a question of economic uh, decolonization. But just to clarify the term decolonization itself, it was used first in the 1920s. There was a left view of decolonization and there was a right wing view of decolonization. The left used it in the common term in the 1920s to suggest not really what we, we understand as decolonization, but to suggest that imperialism was now shifting to a new form. Now this whole debate on decolonization occurred in the early, it occurred because of what happened in the period after First World War. You know, it is suggested by the right wing, for example, people, scholars like uh, Ian Drummond, Clyde Dewey, Tomlinson, I mean, there's a whole range of scholars who have argued that India began to decolonize, decolonize since the end of the First World War. The 1919 Fiscal Autonomy Convention was supposed to be the starter. Now, th this view is a leftover of the liberal imperialist view of the early 19th century that colonialism was slowly preparing us for independence. And then in the last phase, this independence sp speed of the independence, political and economic got speeded up. And 1947 was, after all, the dream of colonialism itself. And the national movement naturally was just a tamasha <laughs> on the side done by the upper caste to entertain themselves and to get the, you know, what the Cambridge school tells you, to get the, 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 the loaves and fishes of power. Hmm? But that, that is one aspect. The, uh, the right-wing view of decolonization actually suggests, people, these scholars say, that from 1919 onwards, it is India which is beginning to exploit Britain. And it is, to quote them, it is all Marxist claptrap to say that Britain uh, was being, uh, Britain was exploiting India, etc. So this is, this is an absurd uh, view, but it is a view which is held, as I said, by scholars uh, of fairly <laughs> good reputation all over the world. Hmm? The actual decolonization in India, the economic decolonization, happens after independence. Hmm? At independence, as you correctly pointed out while introducing us, we got political independence, but not economic independence. Hmm? At independence, nearly 100% marked, I mean, I'm saying it very, uh, with a lot of thought, nearly 100% of the machinery required or the capital would required to make any investment in the country had to be imported. So in other words, to have any growth, we would be dependent on the first world, in the advanced capitalist world, all right? So it is this which was, which the Nehru Malanubi strategy uh, tried to undo and succeeded in doing so. From nearly 100% dependence in 1947, it came down to 9% in the 1970s. That is the the amount of imported capital goods in the investments made in the country in the 1970s had come down to only 9%. So 91, we were making on our own. So that was the economic decolonization. And this process has occurred in large number of countries all over the world. But the, the important point that you made was that decolonization is not only economic decolonization. There are two, as, two more aspects I will like to say a few words and then uh, uh, we will hear everybody else on this. One is the decolonization of the mind. You know, it is the easiest thing is to overthrow the political outsider, you know, visible. The next more difficult thing is the economic, overthrowing the economic domination or what is often called neocolonialism. Uh, the, the much more difficult part are the two, two residual parts. One is the domination, the intellectual domination. To give you just one instance, to be brief, at the moment in Delhi University is taught a scholar by the name of Fitankar Roy, who teaches you what in the colonial period used to be called Angreji Rajki Barkhate, you know, the, the benefits of British rule, who tells you how we had rapid economic growth, rapid economic growth in the 19th century. <laughs> that, uh, that indebtedness of the peasantry only showed that they were actually very prosperous. They were borrowing because they were prosperous, not because they were poor. That there was no deindustrialization, that there was no drain, etc. etc. He tells you completely, you know, a 19th century view of Indian history and calls it revisionist. And it is taught in Delhi University. You know, so the colonization of the mind is a very, very long process which we have to get through. The other important thing which is most relevant today is the longest lasting legacy of colonialism. Hmm? 
is not the economic domination. That has been overthrown in large parts of the world. The whole of East Asia and Asia, for example, is, has, has or is overcoming that economic domination. The longest lasting leg legacy is that wherever colonialism has gone, it has left behind a divided people. From Ireland to India, from the first colony to the most important colony, it's left behind a divided people on the basis of race, caste, religion, uh, tribes, divisions within religion, Protestants or Catholic and so on and so forth. And this aspect of colonialism, which in India saw the form of primarily the division on the basis of religion, that is communalism, and also promoted on the basis of caste, freezing caste differences, politicizing them in a manner that actually split up the Indian people in the long run, rather than build a, a, build a people which was more humanitarian, which was more empathetic to all sections of society. Now, this effort, which was made in the colonial period under the British umbrella, was fought by the national movement. But despite the efforts of the national movement, as we know, the country did get partitioned. And now, 70 years after independence, more than 70 years after independence, we have allowed people who were not part of the national movement, who represented the div div division of India, who were the instruments in the hand of the colonial state in dividing uh, our national movement, in preventing it from growing, they are in power. In other words, the, the legacy of colonialism in this form of dividing the, the Indian people has remained with us to, as the chief obstacle, in my opinion, of our future development. Thank you. Uh, Mridula, ma'am. OK. Well, I would like to emphasize on uh, the first uh, part of the decolonization uh, process. And I would like to also slightly uh, amend what Aditya just said in that he said that the easiest part of decolonization is the political one. I don't think it's the easiest one. Uh, it's the one that happens first and it is in a sense the basis for the rest. Because you, without political independence you cannot have or, you know, the other kinds of decolonization or independence, whatever word you want to use. So that is the primary, uh, primary, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, objective that has to be first uh, achieved. And here, the emphasis that I want to place is on uh, the formulation that I want to make is that decolonization was a result of the struggle of the colonized people not just in India, but everywhere. The struggles took different forms. In India, we had a struggle which primarily uh, took violent channels. So there were other uh, modes of protest also that were adopted by many movements which were associated with and part of the broader movement led by the Congress. In other countries, uh, more constitutional methods uh, of struggle were often uh, followed. And in other countries, there were armed revolts. In some, there were guerrilla warfare. So the methods could vary depending on the political uh, and uh, other uh, strategic and uh, uh, geopolitical circumstances. But I would like to emphasize that nowhere does decolonization occur or independence get attained without struggle on part of the colonized people. It is never a gift of the, the, the of empire. Aditya referred to that in, uh, in, in talking about the economic uh, part where this theory is there that in fact the colony became too expensive to maintain. Not only was it no longer paying, but it was kind of becoming a burden, you know. There is that view which has been put forward by some people. And in that framework, then decolonization becomes an act of volition on part of the empire itself. So in a sense, it takes away the agency from the colonized people completely. 
we can't even claim any rights or any, uh, as I said, agency for our independence. Even that uh, is a gift, you know, and that is actually, a, I think, a very in, uh, important constituent of co colonial ideology in the post-colonial world. It's an ideology uh, or, 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 or element of the ideology which comes up when the empires begin to decline. There is a sense in the old empires, especially of a sense of loss. And here, in order, I think, to somewhere act as palliatives, the story, the liberal imperialist story becomes more popular. We were really very nice. We were really very kind imperialists. Uh, after all, ultimately, we are the ones who left. You know, it was not because the colonized people uh, were really doing anything to get us out. They were, but they weren't really effective. We could have uh, we could have kept them down if we wanted. And in any case, uh, we wanted uh, to you know, the white man's burden. And I said the liberal imperialist uh, framework. That that's how independence uh, came. In fact, one of the theories, particularly uh, uh, for India, is that uh, the Second World War uh, weakened uh, Britain to such an extent that a large part of uh, the the explanation for Indian independence for decolonization is the weakness of Britain as a result of the Second World War. What I could, uh, what I would like to say here is that in any situation there are contributory factors. When we are looking specifically at the 1940s, if we are looking specifically at the period 45 to 47 and explaining certain specific policies that may have happened or the timing of certain events that happened, all kinds of factors may come in, including the weakness of Britain. But in a long-term sense, to talk about Indian independence happening or decolonization happening because the empire became weak, as I said, takes away agency completely from the struggle of the colonized people. And that is, in my opinion, completely unhistorical. I would also like to emphasize that as far as since we're talking about India, it's important to remember that India, of course, was the classical colony. It was the jewel in the empire. Classical colony also in the sense that there was formal uh, integration of most of a large part of India into uh, the empire in, in, in political sense uh, as well, because we have other kinds of colonization in other parts of the world uh, where political power is shared with local uh, regimes with local monarchies, with local nobilities. But here, primarily uh, here we had, as I said, the classic colony where the British had established uh, complete political, economic and social uh, dominance. So, and what is very interesting is that it is in India that the struggle against British colonialism begins anywhere in the world. It's the first country where this struggle begins. And of course, we can talk about the revolt of 1857 as a big national revolt, though I do not classify it as a revolt which was based on the ideology of anti-imperialism or nationalism, but it was a national revolt in terms of its scope. It's important in terms of the heritage of the freedom struggle. But from the 1870s, the modern conception of the Indian nation emerges. And by the 1880s, it begins to get an organized political form, ultimately culminating in the foundation of the Indian National Congress. And it is this process which then carries forward through the Swadeshi movement, through non-cooperation, civil disobedience, quit India, ministries, through a multi, uh, multifarious ways, through peasant struggles, through trade union struggles, till we reach the point in 1947 where uh, the British finally leave India. So I would like to say that it's also important that we are the first colony who also got independence. So in a sense, the process of formal process of decolonization was also kicked off by Indian independence and it had a domino effect. Of course, in other parts of the world, including in uh, former British colonies, the process took longer. 
in Africa well, went well into the 1960s. If we talk about French and Portuguese colonialism, then of course uh, we are talking further into the 70s in Vietnam. Uh, the whole thing continued till the early 1970s. West Indies in the 60s. So there, it happens at a different pace. But I think it's very important to remember because now we tend to forget. But at that time, this was well recognized by contemporaries that Indian independence was the first big blow and the first blow to, uh, and you could say, the, the first uh, stroke in a sense or the first strike of decolonization. So I just wanted to put that on the table for our discussion. Thank you. So both Professor Aditya Mukherjee and Ridhullah Mukherjee, ma'am, have uh, put some interesting facts in the discussion, like the different notion of decolonization in 1920s, as well as the different notion of nationalism that emerged in, in the struggle and the crushed aspirations of the colonized people, as well as the legacy of colonial rule that is divided populations in different countries. So we will move to Professor Sucheta Mahajan, ma'am, for her opening uh, comments. Uh, Ma'am, you're mute. Oh. Ma'am, you're mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, St. Stephen's Leadership Cell and Karva Initiative. I think I've been on Karva Initiative earlier too, and they're doing a wonderful job. And now so is the cell in promoting this kind of a essay uh, competition. It's a great idea. And we're only here to, I think, share uh, some ideas and uh, raise some points which then might be of use to students. Uh, as many of you would know, I've spent a good part of my life researching uh, what I call the independence and partition of India, but uh, otherwise in a more neutral sense, if the word, if we use, one could also call it the decolonization uh, in India. Um, the focus on the British Empire, I think, is very useful because um, I have done some work on the French decolonization uh, in and British decolonization in the 50s, um, which leads me to believe that the two were very different uh, from each other. This is, of course, not the time to speak of it. So I think it's very good that you have Talk, you're talking about the British Empire. And of course, there's no doubt about it that the British Empire was perhaps the only truly world empire uh, in the middle of the 20th century. The others had been uh, there earlier. Now, uh, what happens in the mid 20th century after the Second World War is the beginning of a process uh, as I said, I prefer to call it a waves of uh, creation of new nations or waves of independence for new countries rather than decolonization. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but this is a process which uh, takes off steam. And the main years are, of course, 1945 to 75. Uh, though, of course, if you look at the mid 1990s, uh, you you still have, um, you know, many countries becoming independent. So the process is still on in many ways. And there was a very interesting debate in the 1990s when the uh, Soviet Union was dissolved about whether that was going to come under this sort of umbrella of uh, what we're calling decolonization or not, because uh, there were some elements of that. Now, um, first of all, let me make it very clear that I have huge problems with the word decolonization. As I said, unless it's used as, you know, in its most neutral kind of way of just meaning it's just another word for independence. And of course, other speakers have alluded to it. The fact that the focus is all on the action by the colonizing, the colonizing authority. That is the implication that the withdrawal from empire is voluntary. So there's obviously something hugely problematic about that implication. Uh, even in a situation where factors other than 
the pressures imposed by naturalist forces and popular movements are in the fray. And we'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, decolonization as defined as defined as the retreat of a imperial power from formal empire, from formal dominance, um, is often followed by a global repositioning. And I think that's very important uh, to keep in mind. It's not as if, uh, and here I would, you know, maybe differ a little from Ridula in this, you know, yes, in Indian independence did have this domino effect, but let us not forget that it wasn't a linear process which started off in the mid 40s and ended in the 70s. I think it's very important to underline right at the outset that end of empire in Asia was followed by what one can only call a second colonial reoccupation of Africa. And I think this is very important to remember because I think this also underlines the fact that local factors, what's happening on the ground in each colony is what is crucial. And not that something has changed, uh, you know, the winds have changed as the famous speech or was all about. And, you know, so now things are going to change right now. So empire does disappear as a political form. There's no doubt about it that other forms, economic forms come in, though here, I want to stress again in the beginning that uh, I'm not one of those who buys the argument about uh, de uh, neo-colonialism in the way that the ultra left has put it across. Um, I also have a problem with decolonization because in much of the writing on decolonization, the term is used not merely to suggest withdrawal or even voluntary withdrawal, but it's often presented, particularly in imperialist writing of that time, as a very well thought out strategy of the European imperial powers, a goal, you know, along with the used words like devolution of power, a goal which had to be reached with great skill and determination. And I find that in 1947, in India too, and I've quoted this in my book, Independence and Partition, Erosion of Colonial Power in India, that right at the time when they were actually engaged in what can only be called an ignominious scuttle from India, they were still talking about how it's all about this very graceful withdrawal that they are going to make, which is the culmination of eras and decades of a process of self-government, which they claimed had been set in process right from the beginning of the 20th century. So there is this whole facade, there is this whole veil of you know, uh, self-government, a kind of liberal view of imperialism, which fits in very beautifully with, of course, then uh, with decolonization spelled out as this uh, very carefully wrought strategy. The reality, of course, uh, we in India don't have to remind ourselves was very different. Partition, as you know, in India was a very violent affair with huge repercussions. Uh, maybe all four of us in this room, uh, you know, uh, Mridula, Aditya, Dipesh and me are, I think, in a sense, children of partition. Our parents and you know, families do come across from the other side. And, um, and of course, there are huge uh, repercussions, which is not the time to talk about this today. I just want to make a few very quick points, list them, and then disappear for a while, and I'll come back to them. Uh, the main two points are what we saw in India was independence, the f a final act of the independence struggle, not decolonization. Number two, to repeat 
something I really feel is important. End of empire in Asia was followed upon by a second colonial reoccupation in Africa. So, so you have India, Indian independence, not neo-colonialism. And again, I'm underlining this point that the whole argument which we grew up on from R.P. Dutt to Sumit Sarkar, which was that, you know, the, it was only a transfer of power what happened in 1947, that a metropolitan elite simply transferred power to their colonial counterparts, I think. And uh, somebody said has, that my host has un, uh, mute, has muted my video, or am I clear? No, no, ma'am, you're clear. You're clear. Okay, Actually, okay, I was okay, hearing sorry. some noise, sorry. so I was muting people. So just because it, it doesn't okay, create a disturbance. I'm sorry. I, I sorry, just got some images and something. I'm really sorry, Kathy. Uh, so, as I said, uh, not neo-colonialism in an ultra-leftist sense. The fourth point I'm flagging and leaving it there is that I think it was the pressure from nationalist forces over the years, which eventually were more important than the international factors which came into play after the Second World War. And last but not least, I think that because with the moment we talk about decolonization, there's also this bit about continuities with colonialism, this argument comes in. And I want to make it very clear that I believe that the rupture that was marked by the National Liberation Revolution, which took place in 1947, with all its limitations in terms of caste, class, gender, etc. We can talk about this some other time. But regardless of all these limitations, the rupture was huge. And the continuities with colonialism, I think, much more limited and not something which kind of, which would make us undervalue or underestimate uh, the break that was marked by the newly independent um, state. And I think this is hugely important. I'll just take one minute more on this that I think it's hugely important to remember that in 1947, uh, you know, today we only talk about partition, but that's because we were correcting uh, what was possibly an preoccupation with independence, uh, which had been there in the first, say, three or four decades after 1947. So we were, of course, talking about it. But now I think that wheel has come full circle and we need to talk about both independence and partition. And uh, I think yeah, it's very important to remember that along with uh, partition in 1947 came along a newly minted state, secular in a communalized setup, committed to citizenship rights to all, important because Sri Lanka next year was not going to give them, committed to social justice, fiercely its own person, that is, resistant to being in any of the Cold War camps. Don't, don't forget that decolonization or independence movements were also coterminous with the beginning of the Cold War. And also undertook the dismantling of colonial structure and, pot, uh, and policies. So I feel it's very important to remember this today because there, I think there's too much talk about continuities between colonial and post-colonial regimes. Just as Chris Bailey uh, tried to blur the distinction between pre-colonial and colonial, there has been a tendency. My own very dear colleague, Indivar Kampekar, for example, has you know, stress the continuities rather than the breaks in terms of the ICS and et cetera, et cetera. And um, 
last but not least i think we must recall that the commonwealth which is often given as an example of continuity with empire that india remained with the commonwealth uh, it's very clear that india remained as a sovereign uh, republic and all that the commonwealth was was a kind of packing case for so called cultural academic exchange that's all it's been so the ghost of uh, decolonization if we can call it that was very clearly laid to rest i'm happy to come back to any of these points later thank you thank you professor mahajan she has mentioned some important points that we'll take in further rounds of discussion uh, professor deepesh uh, chakravarti has joined us from chicago sir please thank <clears throat> thank you and a good evening to you all and uh, thank you to the st stevens leadership team for inviting me and uh, and it's very nice to see two of my old friends uh, aditya medila and sucheta uh, sucheta actually i saw a while ago in chicago when she was visiting and uh, medila and aditya i haven't seen for a while uh, but you know what's nice about it is she was mentioning was um, we were all once young together and used to argue about things and we're all now getting old together and probably will still argue about things <laughs> every generation takes its own arguments to the to the grave you know and then another generation comes up and argues differently and as you could see from the presentation that it's very hard for historians to not present a point of view as they talk about what happened in the in the past i mean so um three of my esteemed friends of all of them express disagreements with other scholars and their points of view um so in the so in some ways um i think particularly after the war um history has been shaped um through debates in and particularly in indian history it's been shaped through debates and sometimes you know when i'm teaching in america it's um, it's always easy to teach a debate uh to foreigners than to teach history uh but in some sometimes i find that debates um short serve histories and i often have to remind my students that the historian's account of what happened is is always falling short of what actually happened um and uh, so you know when i was young and I, my first piece of work as my friends would know was in labor history and uh, and i began to do work on labor history when when i was in in calcutta training with barun day and i'd read ep thompson's the great book the making of the english working class like everybody else had in those years in india and i used to think that this was not just a, not just about ep what ep thompson thought it was actually about what happened in in british history in particular in the history of the english working class until in the course of my research i went to england and and as it happened i stayed with a with an english anthropologist friend who was from a very working class background and one day she said to me you know dipesh i don't see myself in that book and i don't see my friend in that book and i thought wow so the book was not <laughs> so book was as much a pitomson as it was about what really happened right so i think so it's it's always at least i tell my students that you have to remember that what a historian writes about a period is going to fall short of what actually happened because it's like you know your memory of your life is not your life there are many things you can't remember so and the many things are actually lost in the details of history that's why people that's why we argue in some ways we go back we discover new facts we then say this point of view was not right etc so uh, but there is this uh, but i find it somewhat of an occupational hazard that that you have to almost um, launch into a debate as soon as you begin to speak and i was very much part of that culture i mean indian history was in my growing up it was divided into camps you know the cambridge school uh, our subaltern studies it wasn't a school some people said a school but anyway but subaltern studies camp the uh, camp is a more military metaphor than a school and uh, the jnu uh, school i might say uh, all of these things and and some of the fights were bitter and some of the fights sometimes ended friendships so though in this particular case i'm very grateful that the fights didn't end friendships 
Um, so, so maybe what I can, I mean, I agree with most of the things that have been said, at least in terms of mapping out the debates. And you have confined it to British Empire. And because I began my teaching career in Australia, so I saw another part of the empire, which was based on a settler colonial idea of um, the British Empire. And the very word settler colonial reminds you that the word colonial, the colony itself has a long history and it, it acquires new meanings in the course of its life, right? So when, when the British used to use the word colony in the 19th century, and they in the 19th century wouldn't have thought of India as a colony. The colony, the word colony was used more in the Roman sense of a place where you go and settle. So the settler colonial, where actually Europeans went and settled in uh, Africa later, but in North America, before that in South America. Uh, now these, these were colonies. So actually the first series of decolonization in the, the modern sense, if one was to use the word anachronistically, anachronistically happened in the Latin American countries, right? And most of these Latin American countries became independent of their imperial masters in the 19th century. Um, it didn't produce a kind of post-colonialism of our times because uh, again, the meaning of the word colony was different. And uh, uh, so, you know, Argentina became independent in 1816 when uh, the Hindu college had even been started in, in Calcutta. So we are kind of the, the second wave of empire and the word the, the word in which we word decolonization and colonialism, imperialism, and these are 20th century words. And, uh, and they, again, give the word colony a different kind of metaphorical charge, which we now accept and use. So in the settler colonial nations, there are a bunch of people for whom decolonization in our sense never happened. These are the indigenous peoples. Um, the indigenous, because the settlers never left. So if you look at the historiography of sovereignty, of uh, decolonization in those contexts, um, you will find that there's a mixing of metaphors. Sometimes they use the word decolonization in the way in which we might use it in the Indian context. And sometimes they speak very differently. I mean, they speak of shared sovereignties um, they speak of degrees of sovereignty uh, because in, in the way in which a 20th century non-indigenous decolonizer like even Franz Fano could think about decolonizing, the gesture of decolonizing, that simply wasn't and isn't available to these people because, because the Europeans are not going to pack up and leave, nor will the immigrants like myself. I mean, we will leave the Europeans left, but we would, but you know, the Europeans are not going to leave. So, so there is another history of the word colony that is played out in, in those sectors. But it is also true that there have been expressions like national liberation around from the time of the First World War. Um, Lenin famously talked about the colonies being the weakest link in the chain of empires and uh, had this debate about with them and Roy, as you know, uh, as to whether or not Gandhi was a force for good or a force for bad. Um, Tange's first book, the communist leader was about Gandhi versus Lenin. So a lot of uh, these thoughts in India actually, in terms of what it means to be opposed to British rule, definitely became more intense in the 20th century and, and gave rise to our forms of, of decolonization. But what happens is, so in the 20th century, the word to be colonized uh, became somewhat different from uh, just the meaning of to be a land which is settled. So to be colonized took on a larger series of meanings, including, as Aditya was saying, or Manila said, mental colonization, colonization of outlook. Uh, and interestingly, actually, um, the word was sometimes used internally 
by a people who had undergone the formal process of independence, but could still refer to themselves as having been internally colonized by the nation, right? So Bangladesh is a clear case in point. I mean, the people of East Pakistan felt for a long time that uh, West Pakistan treated East Pakistan as its colony. Not in the old Roman sense, but in the more modern sense of a place that they exploited for resources, for uh, all kinds of benefits. Uh, in India also, there have there have been groups who've sometimes thought about them as having been colonized by the independent Indian state. I mean, the Nagas would be a case in point. Right? I mean, again, those positions have changed. Uh, some people joined the union in union and then fought the Mesos. Fought for a long time. Uh, so what happens in these cases is that is that almost colonialism, the word to be colonized becomes a recursive word that can actually be used uh, repeatedly and on a different scale inside a group as it, as it were, right? I mean, today actually the word that's becoming very popular globally out of the Latin American experience, uh, particularly of the indigenous people's experience, is they oppose the word decolonial to the word postcolonial. And by decolonial, they mean some, to my understanding, utopian uh, ideal of, um, of taking European ideas and institutions out of root and branch, uh, which may not be possible, but they actually argue against our kinds of people. But the distinction I often see historically between, set, say, the indigenous people, the settler colonial situations, and our own situation in India is that, um, and this is a difference between the British em Empire, the British would have considered India as part of the empire uh, in, in India, and let's say the French Empire in uh, Indochina or the Dutch Empire uh, in, in Indonesia, <clears throat> is that the British did give rise to a middle class in, in South Asia. Um, came up at different through different histories in different parts of the country, but a, a, an institution like the university became absolutely critical to producing the first generation of nationalists. I mean, if you think of the first generation of nationalists who are, I'm thinking of the Congress onwards, not going back to the 1857 moment, but they, they all have to do with education. And so in many ways, <clears throat> the, the empire here produced a new middle class, a new kind of people, whereas they didn't do that for a long time uh, with the indigenous people. They didn't do that uh, with, uh, with uh, the with the people who were the results of Atlantic slavery. I mean, not quite the model of colonialism, but still people who are dominated, oppressed, no question. And. And the, and the Dutch and the French didn't produce a middle class to the same degree, uh, fortunately. Um, so the British actually ruled uh, by producing this middle class and this middle class debated British rule, its benefits, it's, it produces very radical critics, it's, it produces produced conservative critics. Um, and, uh, and in some respects, um, you know, we came to, this middle class also came to accept a lot of uh, British ideas and, and not just because we were dominated, but, but by choice. I think one of the most interesting things is, if you look at it, is the history of the reception of Shakespeare in South Asia. And if you look around and see how many uh, language people in, in India have actually translated Shakespeare in producing theatre movements in different forms, sometimes in radical tribal forms, but people have been very moved by the reception of that literature. The whole history of European Renaissance was mediated for our middle class by, uh, by the experience of reading Shakespeare and Milton. Um, you know, I was once in the British Library working through the papers of H.H. H. Wilson, the Sanskritist, who was also a visitor at the Hindu uh, college, the Hindu school. And there's a very poignant letter written, written by some Bengali man who had become uh, a go-down keeper in some warehouse 
before electricity, otherwise I would have imagined him as one of the food corporation of India go down, you know, sitting under a little lamp uh, with pastas of chawal or something around him. But he was a go down keeper. And he writes this letter saying the most exciting years of his life were those in the college. Uh, when his mind opened up and, and he saw new things. So there's a deep relationship he formed intellectually with, uh, with uh, Europe through the mediation of this middle class and, 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 and the British and, the, and through this institution that I think this was critical called the university. Uh, now, of course, uh, there've been debates about the role of this middle class, uh, whether this was a microscopic minority, whether they were genuine leaders. I mean, we in subaltern studies once championed the role of peasants and, uh, and others, you know, we can revisit those debates. But one thing I do want to say is that, um, is the climate of the 1950s, and this is before the process of decolonization, as Suchita was talking about, it, or I think Midula was, was even complete. So clearly, if you think about the end of the idea of white supremacy, I mean, it's still being challenged in America, as you know, but if you think of formal end, I think of that, I think that entire phase, which was a result of 500 years of European uh, empires comes to an end with the end of apartheid in South Africa. And that's in the 1990s. I mean, Nelson, Nelson Mandela to me is really one of the last um, leaders who stood for something very big, like Gandhi did, like even Nehru did uh, in, in his own way, um, Nairere did. I mean, some of these leaders who actually started the world stage, Mandela was one of those last figures that one can think about. Now, but in that phase, the early phase of its 1950s, and if you read about the Bandung conference that took place in the mid 50s uh, in Indonesia, you will actually find that all kinds of newly uh, independent nations come there from Pakistan uh, to China, Philippines, Nehru was actually instrumental in getting China accepted. The British, the British, the British and the Americans were very opposed to China participating. And Nehru, <laughs> there's a very interesting letter where he says, "You know, we don't want to have, always have to give in. I mean, to what these people want. I mean, um, and insisted on Chauvin Lai coming there. But and and already the nations were. This was Cold War, and the nations were already split between alliances. So Philippines were part of the American alliance. Pakistan was." But everybody was agreed on this idea that there should be a world with no imperial domination, that no country had a right to dominate another country. Now, you know, that moment doesn't last. Uh, India and China began to fall out by the uh, end of that decade and have a war through which we all grew up, which molded us in 62. Um, but you can see that um, that the very thought that you could be rid of domination by another people gave rise to poetry, gave rise to, I mean, a lot of Franz Fanon's writing is really poetic. Uh, and one of the amazing things in the 1960s was that in the indigenous movements in North America, in Australia, they were all reading Fanon to define their sense of sovereignty. And because Fano was, was coming from the experience, a different experience um, of Martinique. And then he was arguing that decolonization meant somehow he used violence as a metaphor, that somehow jumping out of the skin of your body, the body that had been made by colonial forces. And that appealed to a lot, a lot, of, a lot of people. Um, but the last thing I want to say, about this middle class, and then I'll stop and we can go back to discussions. So one of Fanon's, uh, both um, a comrade and, and an interlocutor, someone with whom he also argued uh, very strongly in the book, Black Skin, White Mass, was um, uh, Amy Césaire, who wrote a book called The Discourse of Colonization. And if you read that book, you will see that in one chapter, maybe the second chapter, he ends by saying, um, 
It's a very interesting point. He ends by saying, look, what is colonialism? What is European colonial rule? He says European colonial rule is basically a series of failed promises. They promised railways, they promised schools, they promised hospitals, they promised industry. They didn't give, give them to us. It's our job, the, the job of the formerly colonized to get independence so that we can build the schools and the colleges and the industries and the railways that they promised but didn't give us. And that in many ways is the history of the modernizing middle classes that also led the, the experiment and the experiment of decolonization. So whether you look at Nasser, Nasser would in Egypt, he describes engineers as the modern poets of Egypt. Nehru would describe dams and uh, uh, other things as the modern temples of India. And, they, and so there was, a, there was a dream of modernization that this new middle class dreamt, pursuing modernization in a world free of imperial domination. And this is where I want to end by saying and Gandhi presents a very interesting picture in this old story, because he didn't buy into the story of industrial modernization, but he was a very modern man in his uh, notion of account keeping, being publicly accountable for what he did. Um, uh, as you know, there was this ritual between G.D. Birla and Gandhi where uh, every year Bar Gandhi would give Birla a detailed account of how Birla's money had been spent and Birla would tear it all up and put it into a rubbish bin. Um, but Gandhi still had this sense that he had to account for every last paise. I and mean, there's a famous story of Gandhi visiting uh, East Bengal, which became East Pakistan after riots, in Noakhali. And the anthropologist uh, Nirmal Bose was with him. And they had to go from one village to another walking. And Gandhi said, uh, so how long does it take to get to that village? And Nirmal Bose says, oh, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And Gandhi says, what do you mean? You have no use for five minutes? So, so he had used all these always to keep this time watch, right? So he timed it and got to the village and said, it's 17 minutes and so many seconds. That, that this idea that you have to account for the time, that you have to account for the money, that you were somehow accountable. It's a very modern idea. And yet, um, uh, so you, you can see that even visions of decolonization produced multiple visions and people have worked with them uh, to different ends. So maybe I'll end there and uh, let's see what else we have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chakrabarti. And uh, you rightly pointed out the emergence in the role of the middle class. So any, any panelists who wish to interject to any opening statements? Audible. Yeah. Yeah. I, should know. Well, I won't interject. A little old for that now, but <laughs> uh, but did want to uh, you know just add uh, just one point, which uh, which was that you know when one underlines the role of. Um, in my case, you know, nationalist or popular forces uh, being behind that British decision to be in India. Uh, it doesn't mean that one ignores the economic uh, situation, you know, the international situation that there was post-1945, where Britain was, you know, in a hugely reduced uh, position after the war, um, burdened by lend lease agreements with the United States and from a situation where the US had always been told to kind of um, keep off the turf as far as India is concerned. I mean, I'm here, I'm quoting from Churchill in 1943 uh, when America was trying to intervene, you know, during the, uh, the Crips mission. Uh, from that position to uh, being the junior partner in the whole US-UK partnership. And I am linked with that, the fact that um, India had accumulated huge sterling balances in London on account of, you know, unrequited uh, sort of uh, 
expenditure that had been made during the war and was actually Britain's largest single creditor after the war. So this is a game changer. You know, this the economic position. I mean, we talked earlier about, uh, uh, you know, that I think Aditya had mentioned that it's not true that, you know, the empire or the colonies were a burden. Uh, that I, I agree with that. In fact, uh, Aditya's own research and that by Osip Martin and others have showed how, in fact, colonial exploit, exploitation hugely increased during the war. So, you know, so a lot of the writing by, um, uh, by John, um, anyway, I, 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 won't, I won't just burden things with names. But the point I'm just underlining here is that, uh, of course, there are international pressures which are at work. Of course, the Cold War is there, and that's a very big thing. I remember reading some documents of the uh, U.S. foreign policy, I mean, uh, about U.S. foreign policy, uh, where they expressed very clearly their apprehension that, you know, they were in a predicament that the U.S., as you know, had been a great champion of the colonies, uh, self-determination, they called it, of colonial independence uh, during the war. The Atlantic Charter had all been about that. And the colonies were looking forward to this. But after that, with the Cold War coming in, things get very complex, the geopolitical situation. And we might remember that, that now uh, with the newly wrought countries, which uh, Dipesh talked about them at Bandung, um, there was some relief that, well, at least, but that they are now in a neutral camp. But there was, through the 60s, their 50s and 60s, there was huge apprehension in US administration about these newly minted countries uh, going into the Soviet camp. And the page spoke about Nasser and Egypt was clearly an example of that kind of apprehension and the nationalization of the Suez Canal. So, you know, it wasn't as if uh, that dismantling of the colonial and imperial edifices uh, wasn't happening uh, by the new, newly independent countries. So there was reason to, to doubt this and reason to apprehend, but I think it's important to keep this in mind. What I think when I emphasize the role of the nationalist forces in securing independence, it um, does not mean that one is ignoring the international international situation, but one is underlining the fact that within that context of Britain's reduced economic position, Africa, where the freedom struggles haven't yet reached that point of maturity, remains under colonial rule. In fact, the integration of Africa, the economic integration of Africa, uh, in the 50s increases just as there is winding up of empire because of nationalist pressure uh, in Asia. So I think, you know, there are different, uh, we should keep in mind that there are different trajectories, different timelines, uh, different strategies, if you will, uh, on how to demit empire. It's uh, I'm really surprised that there is not as much writing on the demitting of empire as there has been on the uh, acquiring of it. Thank you. Professor Mahajan, uh, I would like to pose a question. Uh, one of the facts that Professor Mukherjee mentioned in his uh, opening statement that the machine to India. So some believe that Britain's industrialization was based on India's deindustrialization in a way, and from the loots of the British Empire and the colonies, as well as the word loot itself, Indian language. So 
do you believe that it is true that india britain's industrialization was based on india's or colonial deindustrialization industrialization uh, yeah thank you for the question there is now increasing acceptance of this view you see the fact that the colony is lost because of colonialism that is that the uh, suffered with the colonialism has been more accepted but the notion that europe was able to grow because of colonialism the rest of the world this took a long time and it is still being debated that this great divergence is critically linked to colonialism was not even acceptable to a lot of radicals including marxists i mean if you read morris dog for example and his when he writes about the rise of capitalism the colonies hardly are mentioned that primitive accumulation as marx had said in the 19th century itself was a critical factor in the evolution of capitalism is something that has been debated and but increasingly now it is accepted one of the best works on the subject at the moment is the harvard marxist uh, uh what's his name swen beckert he's written a brilliant book on the called the empire of cotton where he, he shows the clear link between the rise of capitalism and colonialism in fact he calls the first stage of the rise of capitalism as war capitalism you know it is by letting loose war in the rest of the world virtually that Uh, capitalism is able to arise so there there is little doubt about that uh, and and as for the indian case and there is uh, enough evidence now to demonstrate that what india was contributing to britain i mean one estimate for example that uh, professor utsapatnayak had made was something like about 80% of the gross gross domestic capital formation that was occurring in britain at the beginning of the 19th century came from the colonies that is uh, it, you know you how do you industrialize you industrialize by making investments where do you get the capital from you can't say we'll tax the corporate sector because there isn't a corporate sector you build it on the backs of your working class and peasantry that's how capitalism occurs that's how you raise surplus for investment but to the extent that you have colonies and each country in the world which industrialized in the modern period hmm, had colonies each one of them hmm, from the united states to japan to <laughs> portugal spain france england just name anybody usa everybody had colonies hmm? to that extent you did not do it on your own working on the backs of your own working class and peasant uh, if i have answered that question i'd like to make just two or three uh, more points uh, first i want to say, say, thank the page that it was good listening to you after a long time and uh, really appreciate uh, despite our debates the extreme uh, generosity and friendliness with which you enter into debate which is not always <laughs> seen in our academic world but many thanks for that but just wanted to make a few points that emerge out of what uh, primarily what dipesh was saying but before doing that i want to make a point uh, about what suchita just now mentioned uh, she was she was uh, saying that i worked on this i just want to make this clear that the issue of why the question of decolonization becomes such an important issue in the left and the right in the interwar period because that is precisely the period when a economic transformation occurs in the colony itself for example in india there is a massive import substitution that happens britain is virtually driven out of the indian market between 1900 and 1947 you know then by by 1940s for example we are hardly importing any textiles We are we are importing no sugar. We are importing uh, very little steel, etc., etc. Whole bunch of changes occur. Now this they are saying is decolonization, but the fact of the matter is that because of certain international uh, shifts in world capitalism, to, which was not built by colonialism, certain contradictions in colonialism itself, a peculiar set of circumstances emerged where the Britain was forced. to abandon its markets in india in favor of its what was its primary need at that time which was finance so what they did was for example to give you an example in order to fund uh, the transfer from india they had to increase taxation 
70% of the increase in Indian taxation that occurred in the interwar period was because they had to raise import duties. There was no other tax they could raise. If they raised more, more land revenue, people would have just died. There was, they had reached the limit over the last one and a half centuries, right? So, which meant that imports became more expensive. So there was import substitution was possible. But as Sucheta mentioned, that, that while talking about the abandoning of the market, they forget about what was happening elsewhere. This was the period of the greatest exploitation of India. It peaks in the Second World War. Three million people died in the Bengal famine, which Tirthankar Roy reduced out of his love for colonialism to one million, but that apart. Three million people died. At a time when India was forced to give a loan to Britain, which was the second largest transfer or loan in the world ever. That, that loan was equal to one fifth of the British GDP. So, you know, it is cruel to talk of decolonization, decolonization at a time when you are actually exploiting the colony in, in, the, in the most brutal manner. That's why I said decolonization really begins after independence. Now, linked to this, I wanted to make a few comments on what uh, Dipesh has said. Very correctly, he, he brings in the Latin American experience that one kind of quote unquote decolonization does occur, in fact, much, much earlier. And that is why it is quite interesting that this whole notion of the dependency theory emerges in Latin America. Because they have to explain this situation that yes, there is independence, but still there is colonialism. And that's why the, the whole notion of the center and the periphery rather than the metropolis and the colony, hmm, that you can indeed continue with colonial type of domination in, in so-called independent countries. And Latin America was a very good example of, of that. That is one point I wanted to make. Second, when, when Dipesh talks about the Nagas and the Mizos, and then the, the notion that even after nation states form, parts of the nation state can be treated in a colonial manner, as happened in Pakistan, he quite correctly uh, points out. I just wanted to say that we have to be very careful that we do not equate all domination hmm, to colonialism. Each form of domination or oppression is not necessarily colonial. So, you know, there we have to be very careful that, of course, there is no denying that what is happening in Kashmir or what happened to the Nagas at one point of time uh, or various other parts of the country is domination, is, is oppression of the worst kind. What happens even today in the heart of the country to our minorities and to the Dalits hmm, is, is uh, unspeakable. But that is not colonial domination. I mean, we must make, make that distinction just as we must make the distinction between empires. You know, a lot of historiography has become very, very funny, you know, because they, they talk of all empires as one following the other, you know, the Mauryan Empire, the Mughal Empire, the British Empire, the American Empire, etc., etc. No, you know, and this is research emerging out of Oxford, if you like, where, you know, you don't see the critical break that happens with the colonial empires as opposed to the earlier empires. Similarly, that is why it's very important to see the differentiate between various kinds of domination. Uh, just one or two quick points I wanted to make. Again, uh, when Dipesh is talking about the rise of the middle class, uh, uh, if one may suggest uh, maybe another category that would be probably explain the situation better, which is the rise of a modern educated intelligentsia. Not necessarily English educated. As we know that most of Ramon Roy's breakthroughs, modern breakthroughs in ideas occurred before he learned English. I mean, it occurred in his scholarship in Sanskrit and Arabic. Hmm? Akbar did not need to know English in the 16th century to make breakthroughs which were made in the Enlightenment in the West. When Akbar was making these breakthroughs in terms of reason, rationality, rights of women, etc., etc., in Spain, they were doing the Spanish inquests. So this notion that the colonial countries, people had to wait upon the European West to throw out these ideas and these English educated Indians went and picked them up and appropriated them and therefore are half colonized themselves is perhaps wrong. That there are alternate routes to modernity, that it must be accepted that 
the colonial people also were on a, on a path to modernity as we were. In fact, colonialism actually stops that process of emergence of modernity, hmm? delays it. As uh, Cabral says, our history ceases, stops for 200 years. <laughs> that organic development towards modernity in culture, in economy, in arts, etc., is stopped for a while. The fourth uh, quick point I wanted to make was about uh, the one was that colonialism in the early period, and when Dipesh talks about that really white supremacy ends with apartheid in the 1990s, again, if I may suggest that we uh, do not mix categories. True white supremacy, that is racism of a kind, does come to an end uh, with apartheid. But colonialism, I mean, we must differentiate between racism and colonialism. You, you can be colonial without being racist. The British were not racist for, the, for a long period of the, their colonization of India. In the early phase, they used to think that India was a, it was a greater civilization. That's how the Orientalists looked, looked upon India than, than Britain. Racism comes as an ideology much later in the late 19th century. But so one must make, make, that, make that distinction that uh, just as the oppression of the blacks in the United States today, I would hesitate to call it colonial domination. But of course, it's, it is white supremacy. So they need to make uh, that distinction distinction. Uh, and lastly, just a minor comment on Gandhiji, uh, that uh, true that his idol was not uh, modern industrialized development as industrialization occurred in the world. But towards the end of his life, if we look upon Gandhi as a person who's growing, hmm, his, if, if you do not define him only through Hind Swaraj, hmm? which is at a very early stage of his writing compared to not, not he was not young then, but certainly a, a good four decades go after that and his thought thinking evolves. He is more and more open to the idea of the use of machinery, etc., etc. But in fact, he is moving towards the idea that while you may need more and more machinery, etc., it must be under social control. Hmm? Ra rather than that you do not have machinery and so on. I'm just saying that it, it needs to be investigated. We don't want to uh, quickly freeze Gandhi as he is too often done hmm, into his early thinking on, on, on the subject. Thank you. Can I quickly respond to some of the things that Aditya said? Or if you want to move on, yes, that's sir. fine. That would be great. No, I mean, just very quickly. I mean, uh, again, um, and I won't be, I can't be systematic. You, you, I didn't write down things, but see what happened. What I was saying was the word colony, colonialisms, they get used in so many ways by people to express their feelings. Um, that is very hard to legislate the use of these words. Because these are such powerful words. You know, it's like the more powerful a word is, the less precise it becomes. And I think then academics fret saying we must legislate, you know, but people don't listen. It's like Foucault's word power became so powerful that it became banal. I mean, everybody said, oh, knowledge is power. And they went back to Francis Bacon rather than Foucault to say that. I mean, you didn't need a Foucault to tell you knowledge was power. Uh, but it, the word became so powerful that uh, so, but, but as a word becomes powerful, that phenomenon of a word becoming powerful is always a fact of social history or cultural history. It's an interesting fact. Why does a word become powerful? So when Bangladesh said we are being colonized by East Pakistan, I don't believe personally, looking at some of the books, that every aspect of what you might regard as truly the definition of a colonial relationship would actually hold for the Bangladesh case, and even less so perhaps for the Nagas and the, and the Mizos. But aggrieved people who feel domination then come to use the word colonialism precisely for all the power that the word has acquired in the 20th century uh, to make that point. About Gandhi, you know, it's not a matter of freezing him, though, I mean, there are statements from Gandhi right towards the end of his life saying that he, would, he still believes in Hind Swaraj um, and he would not depart from it. 
But there are also really interesting, um, there's a letter from between, that he writes to Nehru in 46, uh, so two years before he's killed, uh, saying that, you know, uh, and this is you know, that when he says, when I am, when I oppose big cities, I'm not opposed, I'm not opposing modern education or, or even, even he says modern health, but he thinks, but I think if you go for mega cities and you bring tons of people, millions into a city, you can't avoid violence, which unfortunately seems so true when you look at the trend today of the world forming mega cities. But the larger question is, you see, goes back to what Britain owes to India in terms of, I mean, every time I go to, see one of the interesting things about Britain is of course, it's a country with almost no medieval past architecturally, it's all destroyed. All you have is neo medievalism of Oxford and Cambridge. So you have kind of very modern Gothic buildings that are trying to, trying to pretend as though they were medieval. And Oxford and Cambridge, as you know, they hold on to their medieval rituals of, you know, which door the master of a college would pass through, which grass he could walk on, all of this stuff. So there's a peculiar creation of medievalism in Oxford and Cambridge, which is based on the money that comes from the empire. I mean, this flourishing of the two universities really is based on the money that comes from the empire. There's no question. Now, so in a way, I think whether India, whether more money comes from India, let's say, to Oxford and Cambridge than from other parts of the empire, and therefore whether India deserves more money back is a national question. I don't go into it. I mean, sometimes small countries may have offered smaller amounts and it doesn't mean that they're in terms of their own experience of suffering in it's any less. You know, people sometimes think that when rich people die, it doesn't cost, they don't cry as much as the poor do, but actually it hurts them just as much. <laughs> but so, so without going into the national debate, I think where, where you're absolutely right, is that the Europeans created world capitalism, which it, its model of accumulation depended on creating relationships that what could broadly call colonial, very broadly. In other words, it's a model that depends on exploiting natural resources, exploiting some group of people. I mean, some of them may later on benefit from it and become, you know, something like labor aristocracy. And the question then is that if people in the process of decolonizing the new nations of the 50s, 60s, 70s, follow the same path of development, the same model of development, without having access to co formal colonies anymore, well, how, what, would they, what would they model the accumulation on? Right? Who are they going to exploit, exploit? And that's why this whole question of internal colonialism, again, it's colonialism is used by metaphor. I'm, I'm, I, I don't think India is formally a colonialist, even under this regime, um, even towards Kashmir, it's not formally colonialist. But if you go and sp spoke to people in the valley, I don't have an opportunity to speak to those people, but I do meet a lot of Kashmiri students because Kashmiri students have gone worldwide, right? They've gone to Indian, other Indian universities as Kashmir became dysfunctional. And I go and, meet, and when I go overseas to Europe and other places, I meet Kashmiri students. And many of them speak the language of colonialism. And this is where people like Fano, people like Cesare, you see. So what also happened is that the experience of colonialism, when it's poeticized, the negritude poetry was doing it to some degree, right? Um, the language of Senghor was doing it to some degree. And that's how the word becomes powerful. So you get anti-colonial poetry, you get anti-colonial literature, you get anti-colonial plays, you get anti-colonial cinema. When, when a word takes on that kind of a cultural meaning, A, I'm saying it's very hard to legislate. You can do it in a classroom and you can fail some students for not following your very precise definition of <laughs> colonialism, but it will still be picked up by people outside to express their marginalization. And where I agree with you is that capitalism cannot survive without marginalizing some people, either inside or outside this national territory. So now one of the things you mentioned uh, by implication, Ken uh, Pomeranz is my colleague, Ken Pomeranz's work on great di divergence. 
Now, one of the things that has come out both from his work and and recently there's a French scholar called uh, Pierre Charbonnier who's produced a book called Liberty and Abundance. And, and he makes a distinction which is based on Ken's original distinction, I think. The distinction between the land you live on and the land you live from. And if, if, you, if you look at all the developed countries of the, of the world, the, what people consume is not confined to the land they live on. They actually live on a much larger territory of land, even through international trade, forget colonialism, than the amount of land they actually live on. And that's why when people say that if you follow this model of affluence, you will run out of land, you will need three or four planets. Because the system is such that the production of affluence, production of abundance, is based on the production of the opposite at some end. And that's why, you know, as you were speaking, I thought Kalan Sennal's book that he published before he died, where he was actually saying, look, primitive accumulation is not primitive in the sense that it's not an ancient phase in the history of capitalism. It is something that constantly accompanies capitalism. And really the question then becomes, and that's why Gandhi is relevant, you know, even in a utopian way today, and particularly now that you have a regime in India that um, A discredits Nehru. Uh, you know, and in that discrediting, there's a forgetting of how much spiritual Nehru's quest of modernization was, as distinct from um, the quest for modernization today. I mean, there's, a, there's an account where Nehru goes to the a dam building site. And he, the engineer is showing him around and he sees all these small people, women, carrying basket loads of soil or cement as they do, as we've all grown up seeing them, to the site. And he says to the engineer, have you explained to these people why they're working this so hard, why the dam is being built? And the engineer says, no, but they're not literate people. What, what can I say? But Nehru says, if they don't understand what this project is about, what's the meaning of this project? Now, today you might have all kinds of environmental critiques of dam building, and I will probably accept most of them. But you can see that in Nehru, the real moving spirit were the people, were not the dams by themselves. So when he used the word temple, I think there was more theology in that word than just a loose metaphorical use of that word. Right? I mean, that's why in that sense I say that it was spiritual. I mean, today, the debate is really about whether it's 8% growth or 25% or 29% dip in the last quarter. <laughs> now that is a very different discourse. But my question is where we have stayed the course, maybe because we are, um, um, we still, there's a, there's a national elite that still believes A, in modernization, and B, even more than Nairobi people did in becoming a big power like China or, or a US securing a seat on the Security Council, right? And, and therefore, that critique of capitalism that you were uh, actually making, I think it becomes even more relevant. But it has to be a critique that has to allow for people who are expressing their experience of having been marginalized through a polysemic word like colonialism. So my only friendly amendment to your propositions would be when a word becomes very powerful, I find that it's, it's um, if I may say so, it's respect. It's a academics fret, but that, that fretting doesn't get us anywhere. You know, Edward Said wrote a book called Orientalism, which I, I don't like the book myself, because I don't think it's a very beautifully written book or beautifully argued book. But the book somehow had tremendous impact. And the word became very powerful. And today you might write another book critiquing Saeed and showing where he's wrong on this or that. But you know, you wouldn't have the kind of impact that the book did because the book had its moment. It came at a moment, it said something that needed to be said. And when we say something that needs to be said, what we say is not necessarily precise. So, so 
Wittgenstein will never become in this way anyway, a very powerful philosopher like Foucault did because Foucault had a button which he could both philosophize but which yet remained a popular button like power right so so that's why i'm saying that that, that colonialism becomes it is a tribute to anti-colonial movements of the world that the word becomes so powerful that indigenous people used it you know uh, sometimes african americans use it in terms of today people who are trying to talk about world over i don't fully agree with them decolonizing the curriculum and 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 I go back to the question of the middle class. Look, you know, for me, when I was writing Provincializing Europe, what really stopped me from discarding European thought holas bolas? Because you know, I mean, as you say, I mean, as a, I knew some of these histories. I mean, of Akbar or uh, the the kind of stuff that uh, um, what's his name, Jonathan Ganeri works on. Uh, um, but was reading Ambedkar. I mean, I, when I found a sentence in Ambedkar which said that he wished Indian history had started from 1789, I thought, wow. You know, I'm born into a Brahmin family. <laughs> I mean, not in a rich Brahmin family. I mean, no, this is not a Maratha Brahmin family person speaking. It's a Bengali Brahmin family person speaking traditionally either priests or teachers, school teachers. So I'm not part of the oppressing Brahmin kind, but I'm still from Brahmin family. And I stopped. It, it stopped me in my tracks. I thought, here is a person speaking for the most oppressed, at least one of the most oppressed groups in India, who wishes, who wishes that his history began with the French Revolution. I mean, there could not be a better tribute to what we owe to Europe, I thought. Uh, and that's why I, I basically said European thought is both inadequate and indispensable. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my situation is like uh, Winston Churchill in his old age, who wants to who wants to continue as a prime minister. So we are running out of time, and I have to retire. And and so I'll, I'll just ask you a concluding question i'm combining two big questions in one the one is what professor mridula mukherjee mentioned that there were different notions of nation state and nationalism emerging in the process of decolonization and the second question is are we completely decolonized or is it a continuous process of generations So maybe Professor Mizulam Mukherjee can can start. Okay. Uh, well, actually, the questions partly address uh, one or two points very briefly, which I wanted uh, to make. So I'll just take it all uh, together. Uh, I think uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, I just want to join in the discussion on uh, the influence of uh, Europe, uh, middle classes, uh, emergence of the middle class through education, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that whole uh, uh, framework. I just wanted to make a very brief point here, uh, which I think partly might uh, explain um, the phenomenon that we are uh, discussing with a slightly different framework. I think uh, it is my understanding that one of the great achievements, intellectual achievements of our uh, modern intelligence with Ram Mohan Roy was to be able to make the distinction between modernization and westernization. And therefore, unlike many other places, Japan, for example, uh, we did not have to either accept everything that was Western. You know, in Japan, they even said you have to eat beef in order to become modern. They adopted Western music as part of their curriculum in order to become modern. They were not able to make that very crucial distinction between modernization and Westernization, which, right, as I said, from Ram Mohan Roy onwards, we did. So we could adopt 
the new modern ideas, especially the radical ideas, going back to what Abedkar. Don't forget, Ram Mohan Roy too was very interested in the French Revolution. You know, he, he wanted to and yet did visit France, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, the main point is that, and right through especially the history of our freedom struggle, from Gokhale, Dadabai Naroji onwards, Gandhi Nehru, the, the left who adopted Marxism, didn't reject it because it came from uh, the West. I think there was never that discomfort because these ideas were seen as modern ideas which belong to ideas can emerge anywhere and once they emerge they belong to the whole people. Whoever takes those ideas and makes them their own, bends them to their own needs, adapts them to their own situation, that's how ideas work in the world. And we never felt compelled to reject modern ideas because they were coming from the West, despite being a colony and despite therefore there being some kind of push in that direction. There were certain sections of Indian society who did that. But the, the progressive sections of our society, the intelligentsia, right from Ramu and Roy onwards, did not do that. And right in the freedom struggle, of course, uh, it was always the radical ideas of democracy, for example, when Gokhale and the moderates talk about uh, wanting uh, to adopt the British uh, uh, political system in any way, they are talking about what is the most radical at that time in that political system, which is not even fully implemented then. Uh, just to give you an example, the Constitution of India bill, which Tilak brought out in 1895, had full adult suffrage and we know that women didn't get the vote in England even in England till after uh, the war and in France much much later many other countries so what I'm saying is that we we were having been able to make this distinction first intellectually and then in our political practice there Gandhi comes in very useful because he makes the crucial distinction that we are not fighting the British people. We are fighting a system. We are fighting the system of colonialism. We are not fighting the white people. We are not fighting Christians because not, none of that has anything to do with the domination. What has to do with the domination is the colonial system of exploitation. We have to fight against that. Once you have that concept, nothing prevents you from absorbing from the British people or the French people or from whoever the best ideas that you need, as Gandhi himself did. He adopted also ideas from Tolstoy, from Thoreau and from others and the most radical ideas of democracy, uh, which he adopted. Even his, it, it arguably, his critique of modernization also had roots in the romantics critique of modernization which of which there's a strong tradition in britain itself so and i do not uh, do not see it in terms of a derivative discourse that a nationalist or an anti-imperialist discourse to be authentic has to show itself to be completely uninfluenced by europe or by britain no that's not the way the world works you know, so this is the point that I wanted to uh, bring in uh, into the debate. The other point which addresses uh, the question which has been just asked. In fact, I wanted to make that point. I'm so happy the question got asked. In my opinion, the process of decolonization or freeing of the colony from uh, colonial uh, domination of all kinds is a process. Uh, it is not only the, the political process that begins before independence and culminates in the political independence. The other processes also, at least the conceptualization of those processes and some of the practices go on simultaneously. I'll give you, for even in the economic realm, I think if you look at the history of the Indian national movement, I mean, you can just take uh, as a shorthand the Karachi resolution. At the Karachi resolution, both in terms of what should go into the constitution in terms of fundamental rights, in terms of uh, uh, civil liberties, freedom of press, freedom of association, rights of workers, rights of peasants, right to unionization, it's all there in a nutshell. So the conception, the future conception of a decolonized free India is there. 
in your economic realm as uh, well, including right to the level of detail. 1938, the Indian National Congress sets up the National Planning Committee, which has many committees under it, which go into every possible aspect. And Subhash Bose, in fact, uh, chairs that National uh, Planning Committee. And it is not for nothing that the, that the process of planning started, therefore, so soon after independence, but a, a lot of the blueprint uh, for this in terms of basic ideas had already uh, been thought out and that I see as the process of decolonization. At the cultural level, I think it's the political practice, the practice of the social reform movements, the practice of the, the political movements, working class movements, peasant movements, the national movement itself, the Congress itself. I guess simple things like for example, adopting Indian dress without making a hue and cry of rejecting Western dress. Did not all, all nationalists, uh, you know, adopt the Indian style of dress? Gandhiji, of course, adopted not just an Indian style of dress, but reduced his dress to the minimum uh, possible. And I think there's something about that image of him walking up the steps of the vice legal lodge to go and for talks with Irwin or going to meet the Queen with the kind of clothes to wear, which is a cultural statement, a very powerful cultural uh, statement. And this was down the line, down to simple things like it is around the non-cooperation movement when it started. I think it was the Ahmedabad uh, Congress in which for the first time in the Congress, people sat uh, on the floor from tables and chairs. It became, uh, you know, that these and uh, as I said, on the floor open meetings, you know, right from halls, you came into the streets, into tents. I could go on giving uh, so many simple examples. And then the actual practice of the freedom struggle in terms of the cultural uh, symbols, you know, Congress sessions. Uh, at, I think it was the uh, it was the Facebook session, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, where where uh, the, the, the all the decorations, the entire pandal uh, had been conceptualized by our best artists and our best, uh, 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 you know, designers, all, all indigenous. There used to be always an exhibition of Indian products. So I don't want to take more time, but I just wanted to make the point that it is a continuous process. Is it not something uh, and political, the struggle for political independence cannot be and was not just confined to uh, struggling for a formal political independence from Britain. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mahajan, if you wish to uh, comment on this. Can't hear you. You are on mute, ma'am, I think. You are on mute. OK. Is that all right now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I said one quick point. Uh, you, your question is about, is it a process? Of course, it's a process. It was a process. Um, as I said, uh, it did not even, it was not an event which, you know, happened, say, in the 40s. They were, its roots went back to the 1920s, at least in the case of India and maybe even earlier. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the destructuring or the dismantling of the colonial edifice in the political system, in the economic system, and I think most of all in the cultural sphere uh, is something which is not yet complete. You know, we often talk about um, a nation in the making, India being a nation in the making. And here we are talking about colonialism in the unmaking, you know, in, in dismantling. And um, since we, since, and here I just wanted to emphasize just one point, which was about uh, culture. And uh, that even today, this is something which I'm emphasizing because all of you are students here. And it is, I think, such a great tragedy that the process of what we could call decolonizing the mind um, is a process which is not yet complete. 
um, every year, I mean, some of us, we are all from the best universities in this country. And sometimes you think you are merely becoming feeder institutions for the universities in the West. Um, and of course, you know, the African writer, uh, Nagugi Van Thongo had, you know, emphasized this in an article that he had written called Decolonizing the Mind, where he um, had many years ago pointed out how um, emphasizing on language, the importance of going back to one's own language, because the very structures of thought which are embedded in the alien language which you have adopted don't allow you that the possibility of expressing what is real in your own experience uh, and and closer home some of you uh, and here i'm addressing the students only some of you may have read the uh, article by number singh professor number singh who was you know a well-known Hindi teacher and uh, literata himself called Decolonizing the Indian Mind, where again he takes up the whole issue of tradition, modernity, language, and uh, emphasizes the need for an Indian literature and somehow, you know, uh, coming out of that. And I think this domain of culture is possibly where the cultural hegemony of uh, colonialism and what has continued after that um, is something which is still very entrenched. We made a huge breakthroughs in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, uh, again, addressing my student friends, uh, you could read what Professor Romila Thapar has written, a very fine piece on his, the emergence of history writing, the whole textbooks in India, something which she has written in the History Workshop Journal, among other places, where she's talked about this imperative that was felt by her, Bipin Chandra, Sajid Chandra, many others, to engage with history writing for children, for young people, in order to um, destructure colonial and communal uh, history writing. So yes, the process is something which is very much continues, um, not yet complete, not at all. And in fact, as we get rid of some of the old ways, um, they return, the newer ways come back then, which are even, you know, sometimes more embedded in, um, you know, colonial structures to be used in a very wide sense uh, of the term. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Chakrabarti, if you would like to comment on this. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I just want to go back to what Mridula was saying. And I think she's right in the sense that um, overall the Indian middle class was confident in what it was taking. I, I was making the, and particularly in the recent books like Madhav Khosla's book on the constitution, uh, makes that very clear. Um, that we were confident in taking what we were taking. We were actually not only confident, we were ambitious. I mean, India was a huge experiment, experiment in democracy because of the way it, uh, the leaders had insisted on universal level franchise from the beginning and in the way that we actually implemented it. Um, but the point I was making was that the university as an institution had a very important role to play in our kind of colonies, as distinct from, you know, the Maoris in New Zealand or the Australian Aboriginals who actually didn't go to university until the late 60s or 70s. I mean, they now have a Maori university in Australia. And the indigenous argument, that's why I'm saying that, that People have undergone colonization without having circumstances in which to produce a middle class that whose leaders actually go through an institution called university. I have a very different response in, uh, to this question of colonization than we do because, um, because what the universities did, I mean, this 
this is a particularly European capacity we've tried to emulate. Think of something that the, the work of Muzaffar Alam and Sanjay Subramaniam has documented in detail travelers' accounts between, let's say, Middle East and India in Mughal times, right? People came, went, wrote accounts of travel. And now, thanks to their work, you can see it. So it's not a negligible amount. But India did not have an institution in which to make use of these accounts in the way that Kant actually was using travelers' accounts to teach a course on anthropology in his university. So, so what happens is, that this is why I'm going, um, that, the, that particularly in, in producing people like the four of us and people like you who are coming up to the system, there is a Western institution called the university. And you know, if we had the Nalanda later on, we didn't have universities in the Mughal times. Uh, one thing that actually, as you know, Bernier comments on is actually the lack of interest on the part of the aristocracy in setting up academies as they were doing in Europe. And he attributes it to the Mughal policy of not letting uh, an aristocracy of inheritance grow because the Jagidar were sort of being transferred. That was his critique. But coming from a early modern Europe where he had seen academies in Colbert's France, he was actually reading the Indian difference in terms of uh, the European institutional differences. I mean, now Janathan Gamari comes along and shows that there's a discussion going on between a, uh, a, a Muslim scholar and a European traveler on philosophy in Danishman Khan's house. But, but one conversation or a conversation in a very particular uh, setting does not constitute something like an institutional capacity to process uh, information. And I think the fact that the British created it, and of course there have been debates about what model of university, the London model or the Oxford model, and, and after independence, JNU itself was a very interesting experiment in creating universities. I'm simply making the point that, the, that for us who have had generations of experiences, at least for the privileged sections of the people to go to university, it's a very different experience of colonialism and our engagement with Europe and European heritage compared to the indigenous people. Um, African-Americans actually created their own universities for, I mean, there were black universities created. And in that sense, um, even in our case, you know, we, the moment you have that, then you have intellectuals who speak of double consciousness in the way that Du Bois did. In other words, you know something that you've actually learned from negotiating European forms of knowledge. And you have a memory of actually having come from societies where, there, where other forms of knowledge is very prevalent. And if you look at 19th century, uh, Indian history, intellectual Indian history, you will find these debates going on in families, between generations. Um, so actually the acquisition of this knowledge was not without debates, not without hurting some people. But at the end of the day, however good or bad our universities are, we did, the British did institute a particular institution that were mostly managed by Indians, where Indians were professors, Indians were students, in fact, it's amazing to see how many, if you go to different regions, you will find, and I guarantee you this, I know about Madras and Bengal, I'm sure you'll find it elsewhere. You will see how many well-known Indian professors of Shakespeare are there. You know, almost every university will say we had so and so brilliant teacher of Shakespeare. Uh, Bengal has many. I know the Tamil Nadu has many. And, and that for me is a very different experience of being colonized compared to the people who didn't have this, where the very lucky few went to the metropole. And that's Franz Fanon, that's Césaire. They all had to go to Paris. Um, Lamming has a book on, a, I mean, uh, Naipaul, for instance. I mean, these are very different experience of the empire where they actually had to go to the metropole to, to establish themselves as writers and this. Whereas in India, what do we do? The Europeans helped us to modernize our languages. So look at the number of languages of which dictionaries were produced and grammars were produced by Europeans. I mean, the first Bengali grammar is produced by a Portuguese person. And then Ramon Rai, of course, produces Gaudio Bacon. Um, so it's a very different, it's a very different experience. And I think uh, in some ways, Ashish's notion of the intimate enemy uh, 
catches, at least the title catches some of that. Okay. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Professor Chakrabarti. Professor Aditya Mukherjee, if you would like to uh, give a last comments on this. I'll be muted. Can't hear you. you. Not, not really. Hmm? Okay, now I can hear you. My, my last comment is that I greatly enjoyed the discussion and learned a lot from it. And I you did must too. have more of these. I did too. And it was very nice to be with the three of you. I must say, after a long time, only virtually. One day I hope I'll see you all physically. And, and, and the students too. You were to come to JNU about two or three years ago. Yeah, but you know that yeah, that got, yeah, and partly because my my I was my I was so unwell in my uh, physically that uh, it became difficult to actually embrace the idea of breathing Delhi air for three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that was the main reason why. I mean, my my wife said I can't let you be there for three months, <laughs> breathing that air, which is nobody's fault. But again, it's part of our modernization. Uh, yes, um, exactly. <laughs> the air is very clean now. Exactly, because we have withdrawn. <laughs> the humans have withdrawn. <laughs> That's what I said. That the basic lesson of the pandemic is that it lets you so show it lets you see what the impact of an expansionist human presence has been the moment we withdrew the air is cleaner skies are bluer rivers are more transparent <laughs> some of the animals you don't want back in the cities are back <laughs> anyway thank you all very much really enjoyed it. thank you thank you to the esteemed panelists and it was an honor to host this session and you, it is right that much more has to be said and much more has to be told about uh, the decolonization in India. And as Professor Thapa used to say, it, it says that, you know, we should have Kotu Halashalas in universities to dwell more into these topics like it was in early India. So over to Manas to, to deliver the vote of thanks. And thank you from Karwan and thank you, everybody. Thank you. You're not audible. Manas, Manas, you're not audible. Can you unmute? We can't hear you. No, 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 we can't hear you. Wait, let me. This is Manas. Just to say, I'm muting you. You unmute yourself, Igbar. Yeah, Abulu. No, <laughs> we can't hear you. Speak, about, uh, speak without the microphones. Uh, can know, you speak without? The... Yeah, can you remove the microphone and speak, Ekbar? No, <laughs> you're not audible now. Uh... Just a second. Okay, so so uh, so I'll 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 take over. Yeah. So uh, yes. No, no, no. I'll so just. So thank I'll you so much to Professor Mukherjee, Professor Medula Mukherjee, Professor Dipesh Chakravarti sir, Professor Sucheta Mahajan ma'am for taking our time, and uh, 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 on this very short notice, and on this very large topic that needs you know many more sessions uh, to be followed by this introductory session. Thanks to St. Stephen's College and uh, the administration of St. Stephen's College for this beautiful collaboration with Carvan. Thanks to the leadership cell and thanks to everybody who joined us live this evening. And the video will be available on YouTube channel very soon. And I think that will be shared through Drive to all the participants on which they will draw their articles, their research articles for the competition. Uh, Kathy, do you want to add something? Yes, yes. Um, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, I am from a science background and uh, I can honestly tell you the talk has been so refreshing. Uh, 
from all the subjects that i've been studying for so long and so intriguing i never thought that you know history could have been so uh, it could it could arise these kind of questions inside me and it's it's really interesting at least now i am willing to open up a book and start reading about history so that's i think a uh, start uh, so i'd like to thank all of our speakers for this um Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mukherjee, you've been awesome. Like I can't begin to like. I know I've heard a lot about all of you, but especially uh, both of you from uh, a lot of my friends. And I was really excited to host uh, you, um, Mr. Jaita Mahajan, ma'am. You've been amazing again. Uh, I had a talk with you, and I was literally nervous when you called me up. But then uh, we've had nice interaction, and I loved uh, the interview that you've taken. The course, this course that you started. uh professor dipesh chakravarti yours was a surprise to me and uh i was really uh like it was privileged and like honorable for me to hear from you uh through ishan we were not expecting that so it was a very very nice surprise so we thank you uh thank you. on behalf of the leadership cell sir st stephen's college i would like to express my deepest gratitude to all of you uh to find time from the from your busy schedule on such short notice and uh, address the audience uh this talk was again an eye opener and i hope the audience enjoyed it as much as i did especially since we have a lot of history people here so i'm hoping it was it was an amazing uh talk for you guys to all the scientists here i hope now you can all start picking up books on history and learn a lot about uh what all the uh, the speakers have said i would also like to express my uh, heartfelt gratitude to the karma collaboration to reach out to us and sort of have this amazing uh, relationship that we have had uh, i would also like to thank uh, our principal professor john vergis for giving us this opportunity to talk uh, to organize this talk and uh, again our staff advisor who have been amazingly helpful to all throughout the journey uh thank you so much for the audience for being so patient and we will be revealing the soon uh, the link for the paper presentation soon you all can submit your papers and we'll get through them and hopefully i'll have a nice time reading them <laughs> thank you so much everyone thank you thank you thank you bye bye thanks bye bye bye